All right, so let's start. All right. Any questions before we start? Anything more? Nope? OK. Anyway, you can come. For well, questions, can, can come and see me later separately, right? OK, um, what we're going to do today is on transmission media. All right? So what we have seen so far are the, basic, the different transmission techniques. We have seen how to transmit analog signals, how to transmit digital signals, how to convert from analog to digital, digital to analog, and so on. Or even analog to analog, and all that, right? Plus also multiplexing. Now all these signals, they're supposed to travel on something. Right? So we generate the signals, we convert the information, the data onto signals, right? And these signals will travel over something. Right? These signals travel over transmission media to carry the signals from one corner to the other corner. So the transmission media can be either metallic, glass fibers, or even free space. Right? So either it is whether cables or no cables. Right? As I said earlier, transmission media must exist between the sender and the receiver, right? all the way. So these are the different transmission media we will look at in this particular chapter. Right? So there are about two types, the guided and, and unguided. And we're going to take, take a look at three types of guided and then about three types of the unguided. Right? So let's quickly go through what it means by guided media. Right? Guided media basically means that the media, transmission media guides the signals. It makes sure the signals travel within the media itself, not outside. Right? So for example, a cable like this, you see the bottom cable down here, uh, this one, is basically a network cable. Right? This is a transmission media. The signals from this machine, when it goes to the server, it goes inside that particular wire. So this is guided. The signal has to follow this, the cable itself. It cannot go outside. That's guided media. Right? So signal is contained by physical limits of the medium, depending on what type of medium it is. And there are three common types of guided media. So first one, the twisted pair cables. Right? Again, as the name suggests, twisted pair cable consists of a cable with a pair of wires which is twisted around each other. Right? Like this. So that, that you, you must have one pair of wires, at least two wires. And the two wires must be twisted around each other. Normally, one, one wire will carry a signal. The other is normally used for earth or, or ground, electrical reference. Right? So the wires is normally, we have a conductor, and then we have an we have insulator on the outside to protect the conductor inside. So twisted pair cable, the thing, next question is, why do we need to twist it? Right? Why, do, why don't we just put two wires straight? Why do we twist the wires? Right? There's a reason behind it. It's basically to reduce outside electromagnetic interference. Now, if you remember your physics lessons, Right, form 5 or form 6 or wherever it is, right? if you have outside energy, uh, electromagnetic uh, field coming in from outside and you, put a, a, you, put it, you, you take a, a piece of wire, copper wire, and then you introduce electromagnetic uh, waves or, or, or even a magnetic force, what happens is the magnetic force will induce a small current, electrical current in the wire itself. A straight wire will have a small electrical current generated by the, by the radio frequency outside or the magnetic force. Right? So this will, if this happens, then it will interfere with the signals which are traveling on the cable. So by twisting it, then what we are doing is that we are trying to, we are trying to reduce the interference, right? to make sure that the, the the interference is basically cancelled out from one cable to the other cable because they, they cross one another. Right? So by doing this, then we try to reduce the, 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 the interference from the outside electromagnetic reference uh, sources. Right? Right? So, the, so this is what the cables look like. Two uh, pair cables look like this. So there will be two, one pair, one pair, one pair. Each pair will have uh, two wires and they are 
twisting around each other. Right? Just like dancing, right? like this twist. Right? So it is for, for a good, good protection, for protection against outside interference. So we have two types of twister pair cables. We call them the unshielded twister pair, the UTP. And then we have the shielded twister pair, we call it STP, right here. The difference is that one has more protection than the other. The unshielded is basically just two wires with a simple insulator and then put inside a cable shielding, right? The shielded twister pair has an extra level of protection, a metallic, like a wire mesh, something like this. Here is very simple, straightforward, there's not much protection. Here you have extra wire mesh to protect and also maybe some kind of aluminum foil also to protect the cables inside. What are they protecting the cable inside? From the same thing earlier, from this external electromagnetic interference, right? So by having this protection, extra, different layers of protection, then there will be less interference in the cable. So the signal will be clearer, it can go further, and there will be less noise inside there. Right? That's the idea. Of course, once you do these things, then the cost of this particular uh, shielded twister pair will be, more, will be higher compared to the unshielded twister pair. Right? But most of the time, we normally use UTP. Right? So this particular cable on the floor here is basically a, a UTP. Right? So most of the, most of the uh, networks, uh, local area networks, use UTP because it's cheap and simple to use. Shielded only use it in particular situation where we think there is extra external inter interference which is quite high. Normal, we don't, we don't, we don't need it. Right? There are different levels, different categories of UTP. Right? The simplest one is basically the category one which is used by phone lines. Right? Remember your, your telephone at home? Right, the, the, white, the two pieces of cable coming out from there, that's basically a category one, right? And then we normally use, for networks, we normally use either category three or category five. Right? Nowadays, most of them is category five. So this particular cable at the bottom of the floor is category five, category five UTP. So this is a, a more common standard nowadays. Almost every local network which uses UTP normally goes for category five. Right? So it can go up to about 100 megabits per second data rate. Right? The higher the category, the faster, uh, the, the more data rate it can, it, can, it can actually support. Of course, it's more expensive also, the cable. Right? For normal usage, we, we go for category five. Of course, there are category six and seven and all that. Right? So this, if, when you buy the cable, if, if you look at the cable properly, you see it's printed over there, category Cat5, right? Cat5 Cat UTP cable. Right? So these UTP cables, they need to be connected to your machine. Right? So we normally use the RJ45. Right? Ladies, I'm sure you're familiar with this, this particular uh, uh, connector. Right? So one goes into your PC, the other goes into, uh, one goes into a card, the other goes into the, this will be the, the, on, the card, on the network card itself, this will be on the cable itself. Right? And if you look at it here, there are numbers, right? one to eight. This means there are eight wires. Right? If you look at this, normally category five cables, uh, it's not mentioned here, category five cables basically has four pairs. Right? It's four pairs of cables. Uh, four pairs of cables like this, right? And this pair, four pair, pair of cables will be put into the pins. So this is the four, eight, eight cables like this. Right? And the uh, sequence has to be in this particular order. Right? <laughs> Doesn't matter about that. And the main thing is that UTP in category 5 has four pairs, eight, 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 eight uh, wires. Now, of course, the UTP uh, cables also have different diameters, right? So we look at the, this, this graph basically shows you the performance of the different UTP cables. Some are thick, some are thin, right? If you look at the, the diameter here, the gauge 18 is basically thicker 
compared to gauge 26, which is thinner, right? So what this graph shows you, shows you which cable is more, is better quality, or rather it can, it can send data without loss. So the attenuation here on the, on the x, on the y axis, attenuation it basically means that how much data loss, right? The higher the value, the more data is lost over a distance. So ideally, we want the data loss to be less, as less as possible, right? So what we do is, we, let's say we compare at a, at a particular frequency, when we transmit data at a particular rate, as let's say at 10 kilohertz, if we're using a thick cable, the loss of data is about one, one uh, decibels per kilometer, right? If you use a thin cable, 26, it lo loses about, almost about six decibels per kilometer. So in other words, the thin cable loses more data over, over distance compared to thicker cable. So in summary, thicker cables are better or, 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 or better quality, right? So what we want is basically to get uh, cables which are normally thick. Right? So thicker cables do not lose data easily or lose data less over a distance compared to thinner cables. And this is what this, this graph will show. Right? So where do we use these UTP cables? We use them in telephone lines for voice communication, data communication, in DSL lines also for high speed data transmissions and also for local area networks, even especially Ethernet local area networks. Uh, there are a few standards here which we will take a look at. There's one chapter on this, so we'll, go, we'll discuss this in that, in that particular chapter. Right? What is 10 base T, 10 base, 100 base T, 1000 base T? All this, this T refers to the, the UTP. It means that this particular Ethernet LAN uses UTP cables, and there are different standards for that. Right? So in our school, we, we, know, we are using this now, 100 base T. Most of, most of our, our cables are 100 base T. Some are 1,000, right, between the servers and all this. But normally for PCs, we all use 100 base T. That's the standard. Right? Category 5 cables. Right? The detailed specification, we will take a look at in different chapter. All right, the second one. All right, so twisted pair cables is basically a pair of cables which must be twisted around. Coaxial cable is different. In coaxial cable, there's only one cable. Right? There's nobody to, twist, nobody to twist with, and you can't twist with yourself, right, the cable. So it's only one ca cable, single core, huh, like this. And the main thing is that it is surrounded by multiple layers of protection. So you have the wire mesh, you have the aluminum foil, you have the insulator, cladding, and all these things. So many covers, plastic, metal, and so on, right, to protect this particular cable, the conductor, against outside interference. And the, the, the interference comes from outside anyway, right? to make sure that outside does not interfere with the signals which is traveling on this particular cable. Right? So because this particular coaxial cable has multiple, uh, multiple layers of, of protection, so it is better than twisted pair in terms of performance. You can transmit data at a higher rate. It has a higher bandwidth. And it is also less, it does not lose data so much compared to twisted pair cables. Right? So again, there are different, different, uh, different standards for coaxial cables. Right? In, in, in UTP, you have category 1 until 7. Here we have, the one mentioned here is that there are th three different types of uh, coaxial cable standards. The RG is basically a specification number, right? And then, so they are, they are categorized by RG ratings. The RG basically describes what is, the, what, is the, what is the thickness of the inner conductor and the type of insulators used, the shields, and also the outer casing, how big is outer casing. Right, so three examples here. RG59 is used for cable TV. 
this is used for, for Ethernet. One is thin cable, one is basically thick cables. Right? They all look the same. They all look like this. Same. Except that some are thick, right? Some are uh, some are thicker, some are thin. So there are different standards on it. On it. Right? If, if you are familiar with your television set, right? Uh, where your television set connects to the antenna, the, the white cable is basically this one. It's basically this, this cable, RG59. That's the one we normally use. And if you open up, you cut it open, you will see that it looks like this. Right? There's only one single conductor inside it. Right? So, for twisted pair cables, UTP, we use the RJ45 connector. For coaxial, coaxial, uh, coaxial cables, we have to use different kind of connectors. Main thing is that, okay, before we go into that, look at this. This is a topology, right? We connect the three machines. Now, what topology is this? It's a? Bus. It's a bus topology, right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now, so bus topology, right? So bus topology means there's a single cable, right? It's a single cable connecting all machines together. So this single cable is basically the coaxial cable normally. So in bus topology, we normally use coaxial cables. So how do we, if it's one single cable, how do we make sure that each the like single cable is, 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 is cut and then we insert a connector so that it connects to each station, each machine. So we use these connectors. So there's one BNC connector here. The T connector is the junction. And then at the end, we have a, a terminator at the end. Right. So in this case, for, for, for a coaxial cable to be used on a bus topology, we require two terminators, right? both sides, to make sure that the cable is, is, is uh, properly, uh, properly uh, closed on both sides. It's not left open. Right? And then we will, if there are three stations, we require three T connectors. Yeah, and then how do you connect the T connectors to the rest, rest of the cable? You use this. So there will be a BNC T connector here, BNC T connector here, on both sides of the this T. All right? It's just basically connectors. Right? They look something like this. Right? Like this. This is the T connector. This is the B, the BNC connector, and this is basically the terminator. Right? Now, what is the job of the terminator? Right? At the end. The BNC terminator. We have to put it at the end of each, each both sides to make sure that the signals do not bounce back. Because remember, this is a bus. This is a bus uh, topology. When this station transmits data, it will transmit data onto the cable. So data will go left. It will also go right all the way. Right? If then the job of, of this terminator at the end is that is basically to absorb the signal, so it does not bounce back. Because if it bounces back, then the signal will be regenerated and mix up. It will, it, will, it will conflict with the original signal in the cable. Right? We will take a look at an example, example later on. Right? So, the, the, so for when we use coaxial cables, we must have these terminators to properly uh, stop, uh, to, to, to properly end the, uh, the, 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 the coaxial cables. Right, to make sure they do not left open. Right. So this is what it look like, and this is how you, how basically you connect. Right. Again, bus bus topology is not very popular nowadays. Right. Main main reason is that if you have a break, if your cable breaks here, or a mouse come and eats the cable, then what happens is the, the holes, all the, all the, all the sections are down, right, because the, the 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 bus is already spoiled. Right. So again, different different coaxial cables perform the the, the, the performance of different uh, standards of coaxial cables. Again, same same graph. This is basically the attenuation or loss of information per kilometer, and this is the frequencies. Right. Same thing. A thinner cable. Point point seven millimeter. 1.2 millimeter of 2.6. So 2.6 cable uh, core, 2.6 millimeter core coaxial cable 
does not lose much information compared to a thinner cable. So a thicker cable is always better. Again, same principle. Right? So where do we use them? We use them in analog telephone networks, right, at home and all these things. Because the coaxial cable can carry very high bandwidth with high capacity. Can also be used for digital net telephone networks. Right? For example, in a company, you have this, this switchboard right, to connect all the multiple phone lines together. So it normally uses a coaxial cable. Cable TV, right? You heard of that. And also we use coaxial cable for local networks. Right? There are two standards. 10 base 2 and 10 base 5. So this basically 2 and 5 refers to different whether the Ethernet, whether the, the coaxial cable use is thin or is it a thick one. Thin is basically like, like this. Thin is normally slightly thicker. Right? In terms of its diameter. Right. Yeah, this is for the thin and this is for the thick. Right? Third one is the fiber optic cable. All right? Now the earlier two, the, the UTP and the coaxial cable both transmit electrical signals. Right? Which we saw earlier, electrical signals are basically can be affected by outside interference. So that you need proper shielding, right? multiple layers of insulation and shielding to protect the signals in a cable from outside interference. Fiber optic cable do not transmit electrical signals. They transmit light pulses, all right? So light, light travels in a fiber optic cable. And the, the, the cable, the fiber op, the optics basically, the fiber is basically made of either glass or plastic, right? something like this, very, very thin, surrounded by protection and cladding. It carries light signals. So we need a photodiode or laser to generate the pulse of light which will be transmitted through the fiber. And then on the, on, the, on the other side, there must be some kind of a, a diode or a photoreceptor which, which will detect the light coming in. Right? So we send pulses of light, off on, off on, off on, like this. Right? So the light will have to be, so when we, we send the light through the cable, uh, through, the, 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 through the fiber, it makes sure that light remains within the fiber itself. It does not go out. Right, so light must be reflected within the fiber itself. So it's something like this. So this is one fiber, right? The fiber is in the middle. This is the protection outside, the plastic sheets. So when we send, it, when we send the light pulses inside there, we must make sure that the light reflects back and remains within the fiber itself. And it reaches the, the other side, right? And again, how we how we insert how we, we shine the light into the fiber again it depends on the angle right if the angle is not if it's low angle small angle then it, the, the the light will actually be absorbed into the cladding the protection if it's, it must be more than a certain 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 degree certain angle only then it will be it will ensure that the light will will keep uh, reflected within the fiber itself Right? So again, this will be done by the, the laser right, to make sure it's properly. So in other words, how the light is shined, how the light is sent into the cable, into the fiber itself is very, very important. Right? If it's wrongly placed, then you will not get a good result. Okay. So fiber optic cables, there are two types, the multi-mode and the single mode. Right? So what it means is this. If it's a multi-mode, what it means is that there are multiple paths for the light to, to travel, right? depending on which angle you do. If you sit in this angle, then it will, it will bounce like this. If you send, if you send a little bit an angle which is narrower, then it, it, it will bounce in a different path. So there are multiple paths for the light pulse to travel in the fiber. Right? That's, that's multi-mode. Right? So when, when you get at the end uh, the destination, the light, what you send is not, what you get at the end is not very high because it's distributed over multiple paths, right? 
But on the other hand, the single mode is that the fiber itself is very thin compared to the multi-mode fiber. So this, these two are fibers. This fiber is slightly thick. This is very, very narrow. So narrow that no matter which way the, you shine the light, there's only one way to shine the light into the single mode fiber. That is only one way for the light to travel. It's so narrow in that way. It's like the light from this particular, for example, like this. You see, it's very narrow, if you can see somewhere, right? Compare, compare if, if I do a torch light. Torch light will be something like a, a multi-mode, where the light basically distributes into multiple parts. Right? This particular pointer, laser pointer, is basically like a single mode. It goes everything in, in a straight line. So single mode fiber are very, very narrow. And it ensures that the light pulse only has one path to travel within the fiber itself. So at the end, on destination, you will see that the light received is very, very high. Very, the peak is higher compared to here. Right? So you can, your reading will be much better. Right? That's, that's the idea. And the gradient is somewhere in between. Right? It basically makes sure that the, the density, gradient basically means that the density of the fiber is changes. It's normally higher there. If it, if it tries to make sure that uh, if you send the data, uh, the, the, the light in this particular direction, it will bounce back in a certain way that you also have multiple paths, but the paths are basically reduced. Right? So somewhere in between, compared if you look at this and this. Right. So obviously, these are the normal ones. Multi-mode is the common uh, fiber optic cables normally used, standard ones. So if you want something more specialized, then you use single mode. So of course, single mode will be expensive because it's more difficult to manufacture a fiber which is very, very thin compared to multi-mode. Right? So these are the diff the, the the standards for fiber optic cables. If you look at the look at the diameter of the core, the fiber itself, so you see these are the multi modes, the three different ones, 50, milli, 50 micrometer, 62, 100, and the single mode is only 7.0 micrometer. Right? That's the thickness of the fiber itself. Right? Now, how how much how big is this? If you compare to the coaxial cable earlier, coaxial cable were Millimeters, right? And the thickness of a crystal cable is in millim measure in millim millimeters, same as the UTP. But in, in fiber optics, we measure in micrometers. So it's 1,000 times uh, thinner than a, than a, than a crystal cable. Right? And this is, our, this is the cladding. This is basically the protection. So the outside layer of the fiber is basically the same. We put them all into the same casing. So the outside thickness is the same, but the, the, the fiber itself, the core is actually uh, very, very different. Right? So you see the difference between single mode and multi-mode. Right? So of course, the thinner it is, if it's very, very thin, the fiber is very, very thin, then it's, easy, then it's very, very fragile also. It's easy to break. So it's more expensive, easy to break. Right? So it requires special protection. So therefore, the fiber optic cable itself, the jacket and the, and the, buff, and the buffers, the, the, the protection, the cladding, all that has to be very, very strong. For example, like this particular cable, the UTP cable on the floor here, you can take it around, you can, you can make it into a knot, and you can bend it, no problem. Fiber optic cable, you take this cable, it's normally it's very, very strong. You cannot, you cannot bend it so much. You can't even bend it like this. You have to keep it something like this. Right? Why we do that is to make sure that the fibers inside there do not break. We do not want to make them come like this. So the materials used for the cladding is normally very, very strong, right? And they use Kevlar. I don't know whether you heard of Kevlar. Kevlar is basically used for bulletproof vests, right? Those army and the police, right? When they, when they go outside for, for, mission, for, for operation, they wear a, a bulletproof clothing. They are made of Kevlar, can stop bullets. So it's very, very strong, right? So they use that kind of material to make sure that the whole, uh, f the whole cable is very, very strong, so not easily broken or bent during, uh, when, it's being, when it's being laid, right? 
So fiber optic has its own connectors. Right, so we have the SC cable, it's called a subscriber channel, uh, this type connectors which is used for cable TV. The ST used for network devices. And then we use so-called MTRJ, which is something same size as RJ45. This is the one normally used for your PC. I say if this PC, I want to use a fiber optic cable, directly connect to it, then I have to use this connector, right? the MJ, uh, M M MTRJ. The performance of a fiber optic cable, again, now the thing is that in this case, the performance also depends on the light, right? So in this case, what this graph shows is that this particular is the same, is the same uh, unit, so loss or attenuation, how much signal is lost over a kilometer. And what this graph is trying to show is that if you shine a different light inside the fiber, it gives you a different performance. Right? If you use a, a red light or a yellow light or a green light inside the fiber, it will give you a different performance. Because each, each wavelength of the light has different properties right? when it travels in the fiber itself. So certain, certain wavelengths will, lose, will have high loss of data compared to other wavelengths, different colors in other words. Right? Doesn't matter. But generally is that fiber optic cables are normally do not lose information uh, much compared to electrical cables. So UTP cables, coaxial cables normally lose data more compared to fiber optic cables. So where is it used? No, it's only used as backbone networks. What I mean by backbone networks is that cables which are used to connect different networks together. Like for example, in, US, in our campus, right, between buildings, between our school and other schools, between buildings is fiber optic cables. Right? Inside the school, it's not fiber optic. It's basically the UTP. Right? It's too expensive to put fiber optic cable in the whole building. Or come to your desktop, or come to this particular machine in fiber optic. We are not the rich. Right? So it's UTP. But between the buildings, yes, it's fiber optic cables. Right, so we connect one LAN to another LAN, we use fiber optic cables. Right, that's how, that's mean by backbone. And this backbone can go very, very high speed. The other usage is we use it for undersea. Right? This, this uh, diagram shows you the underwater fiber optic cables laid to connect different parts of the world. Right? So there are many, many fiber optic cables laid between Europe and the US, the, west, the east coast. Right? From Malaysia, we also have a few from going from, from here, I think from, from Malaysia, from Singapore, goes all the way to Hong Kong, and then there's always go to China, uh, China and also to Japan. Then it goes to the US. There's one to Australia, and one goes to South Africa, one goes to India, and all these things. Right. I, you might have heard a few years ago, there was an earthquake somewhere in the Pacific region, right, in, near, near Taiwan. And one or two fiber optic cables were actually uh, spoiled were, were actually affected, right? So then, those fiber optic cables couldn't be used because they were broken or they were affected by the by the by the earthquake. So then the data was being being routed to different parts, to different different uh, undersea cables, right? Right. So so we use them for uh, undersea cables. Cable TVs, and also we use it for in our local networks. So again, there is a different standard phrase, the FX or X, right? Again, we take a look at this. So there are different standards, fiber optic standards to be used for local networks, right? Now, why we use fiber optic cables? Obviously, it's very very high bandwidth, low attenuation. Attenuation is loss of data, right? So over, over a distance. Fiber optic cable does not lose much data, much, much signals. Another good advantage is that it's, it's not affected by external electromagnetic interference. Right? So you take a big magnet, you put next to the cable, no problem. Right? If you put it next to a, say, electro, a UTP cable or a coaxial cable, it will be affected. Right? That's why we need the protection. But for fiber optic cable, no such thing. 
mainly because the signals traveling on fiber optic cables are not electrical signals. They are light signals. So light is not affected by electromagnetic radiation. And it, it's not corrosive. It does not rust. You put under underwater, undersea, no problem. Right? You don't put UTP cables or coaxial cables underwater. No, you don't put that. Lightweight, right? And also difficult to tap, right? It makes life difficult if somebody wants to steal your information. Disadvantage, it's more difficult to install, right? Maintenance, and also in terms of it's only unidirectional, one way, right? The, the, the light passes can only travel in one way inside a fiber, not two ways at the same time, right? So if you, if you need the other way around, you need another fiber for that. Right? For electrical cables, you can do both ways, no problem. And another one is basically the, the cost. It's very expensive. So when you use it for to connect different lens together, or when when or connect some servers together, or to connect network equipment together, right? When they actually need for it. Right. So that's the guided media, right? Then the second part is the unguided. So unguided as compared to guided, unguided media basically means that transmission media do not control your signals. It does not restrict your signals within, within anything. Your signals are travel, free to travel in any, in any direction, in any way they want. Right? That's mean by unguided. So there's no physical conductor. So this basically is wireless communication. Signals broadcast through free space, available to anyone as long as you have a proper receiving equipment. Right? For example, if you go back to the UTP example, this cable is now on the floor. I can only access the signal inside the cable if I attach the cable to my PC. Otherwise, I, going to, I won't get it. Right? But if it's wireless, yes. If I'm transmitting on wireless, you also can, can receive the signals. Right? And the other thing is that we have a wide range of spectrum available which we can choose, right? the whole range, from radio waves to microwaves to infrared and whole, whole, whole of it. So this just give you an example of the spectrum available. Right? So if you go from left to right, we have the radio, radio waves, microwave, and all these things. On the left-hand side, the wavelength is normally very large right? and low frequencies. On the right-hand side, the wavelength becomes very, very short and high frequencies. So normally for wireless transmission, we use this side, right? radio waves, microwave, infrared. How do we transmit? How are the signals in unguided media being transmitted? There are three techniques. One is basically the ground propagation, right? So if you transmit data uh, signals in below two megahertz frequency, right? The radio waves they can go around the whole world without any problem, right? Because the wavelength is very very large. If it's between this range, between two two and thirty megahertz then we use ionosphere as a reflector to reflect the signals, as we saw last time. And anything above 30 megahertz must require line of sight for transmission. Right? So these are the properties of the, the, the spectrum itself, right? the signals. So this is basically give you an example of where we use them or how we use them. So if we look at this, those are low frequency ones, we can use ground propagation, the middle one we can use for sky, and then only the high frequency we use line of sight. Right? So that these are the different they, are, they have different names for each band. Very low frequencies, middle frequencies, high frequencies, very high frequencies, and so on, ultra high frequencies and so on. And uh, where they're commonly used. Right? So the low one basically used for radio communication, long range ships and all these things. The high one basically used for radar, satellite, telephone, and so on. Radios and radio TV is somewhere in the middle. Okay. This is just for your, for your general knowledge. So we have three. So in, in this particular chapter, we're going to take a look at, at three different types of wireless transmission: right? radio wave, microwave, and infrared. So radio waves, 
right? Basically, they are electromagnetic waves. So when we say radio waves, basically it's the between the range of three kilohertz to one gigahertz range. These are the frequency of the signals which we classify as radio waves. So the property about of these radio waves, they are omnidirectional, means that they travel in all directions from the antenna, right? So waves travel in all directions. Any receiving antenna can receive. So it's normally good for lo good for long distance broadcasting, right? For example, like radios, right? Radio transmission or even TV transmission, for example, right? You have a TV here. You can receive the TV signals from all over, right? And they normally can go go around man-made structures, build walls, buildings, no problem, right? Like inside this room, you can also get radio waves, right? Uh, TV signals, radio signals, you can still get. But, but the main problem is that there is a possibility of interference by other, transmittings, other transmitters using the same band, same, same frequencies. So if you are, you are using a particular frequency to transmit, somewhere else using the same frequencies, then there's a possibility of interference, overlapping of the signals. So the signals will actually be jumbled up. Right? So that's why we require some kind of authorization or permission. So if you need, if you need to transmit in, in radio waves, you require author, a permission from the authorities. Right? So you have to apply, for example, from, from, from the regulator, say, I want, to, I want to transmit my data in this particular frequency, whether it's available or not. If someone using it, then you cannot use it. Right? That's the idea. So we use it for radio, TV, and paging and all those things. So this is what the antennas look like. It's normally, omnidirectional antennas are basically something like these round antennas, right? Because they transmit the signals in all directions, right? Now this kind of, signal, this kind of antennas, if you look at it, there's three different types here. The one on top, which is circular, a cylinder type, this is basically the omnidirectional. Right? If, you go, if you go outside afterwards, on the roof of this building, right, you see so many antennas, right? There's a, big, there's a big satellite dish plus many, many antennas. You go and look up, see which one is which. Right? If those are circular ones like this, cylinder type, they are omnidirectional. And there are some will be like this, uh, square, and there are some which is basically like a plate like this. These are basically point to point. Right? We'll take a look at this later. If you walk along level three, level four, along the corridor, you also see something sticking out from the, from the ceiling. Two or three antennas, white ones, long ones, cylinders. They're basically your wireless, actually wireless APs. And they are actually omnidirectional antennas. After all, you go take level three, level four, level five, walk along the corridor, you will see the three cylinders white cylinders long about like this sticking out from the ceiling. Right? Those are wireless antennas. So they are omnidirectional antennas in that sense. Now the second one, the microwave. So microwave is basically defined to be between 1 and, and 300 gigahertz frequency range. Right? So they are smaller, shorter wavelengths. And the main property about microwave wave is that they are directional or unidirectional. It means that they can only transmit in a particular direction. Right? It's not like all over. Right? So radio waves is all over, microwaves are not. Right? So in that, in that sense, the, the antennas has to be properly aligned to make sure that your antenna is properly aligned to face the right position before they can receive the uh, microwave transmission. And it requires line of sight. So microwaves require a line of sight. So it, the towers must be between 30, 30 to 50 kilometers between. And the main thing is that VHF normally is by themselves cannot penetrate walls, but they can normally can go around and all that. Right. Again, it's regulated. So we use them in satellite networks, wireless LANs, cellular phones, yeah, mobile phone and all that, basically use microwaves. So the antennas for microwave is slightly different. So it will be a dish, dish type, right? 
You familiar with this, the, the astro dish? Right? That's basically a microwave. And if you know your astro dish, you, you probably have to align it at a particular position to point to the right position in the sky so that you can it can it can be communicated directly with the satellite. Right? If you put it in the wrong position, you cannot get your astro signal. Right? So that's because it's lying outside, it's microwave. Right? So the antennas are basically this kind of antennas, dish antennas. Right? So they focus the light, focus the signals, and then onto the particular position like this one here. And you're familiar with this also. You go outside, you look at that. So, this, so this, these towers, this kind of antennas are basically for the microwave. Right? To go from one tower to another tower over long distance. Right? So we can use them either from ground station to one ground station, or the ground station can transmit the microwave to the, to the satellite. The satellite will bounce back and then go to the other side. Right? Satellite communication. Main thing is that it must be line of sight. Finally, the last one is infrared. Right? So infrared is basically between this range of frequencies. It cannot penetrate walls, cannot go through, go around objects, and it's only good for short range communication in an enclosed area. Right? So where do you see infrared light? Something like this: your TV remote controls. Right? Your remote control is normally uses infrared light. And they normally cannot work outside when there's, 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 there's sunlight, very bright light, it will, it will not work outside. It's only, it can only work within a room, within an enclosed area. You go far, it cannot reach. Right? Also line of sight, and again, there is a standard defined for it. Right? So we can have use wireless mouse, printer, remote control, and all these things. And it's recommended that wireless, uh, sorry, infrared does not go more than eight meters for for the distance to be uh, for the signals to travel, and the data rate is normally quite low, right? Okay, so that's the three types. Okay, right. So that's it. <laughs>